I always loved being in the forest. I grew up in Alberta on the prairies. It was a way too little forest. First trip I came out to BC, I just fell in love with it. It was so green and lush and, and everything I wanted. Oh, where are we going? This place, they have these spears and trees. Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't wait to get out here. As soon as I moved to BC, I came out into the forest and never left since. This is Aaron up here. So this one's got a pretty utilitarian interior. It's just, you know, yachty. It's teak, you know. And it's got a loft bed up top, single. Little refrigerator, water cooler. Double bed down below, single loft bed up top, and, uh, and then uh, everything you need to make tea and coffee. You know, so. How do you get up to the top? You jump and climb. No. Yeah. No. Actually, most of the time, people will get a boost, you know. Whoever's down below, if you give them a knee, they can step on your knee and get up that way. You've got to be a little agile to get up there, you know. So what made you start thinking about spears and putting spears in trees? <laughs> I think it was just for me to do, to tell you the truth. It was one of those ideas that came and it wouldn't go away. I probably thought about making a sphere for three years before I started doing Eve, the first one. And my original idea was to do a spherical houseboat. And then I thought, wow, I better learn how to build a sphere first. So I got started on making a little nine-foot prototype. I had it hanging from the ceiling of this great big shop I was renting at the time. And one day a block let go and next thing you know, here's my sphere hanging on the end of a rope, bouncing off the walls and it bounced right past the window and everything and I thought, oh my god, I've wrecked it, you know. And, ah, oh, hell, it was fine. It did what a sphere did. It bounced like a ball, you know. And so I thought, wow, that's a tough little nut. I should put it out in the forest, you know, so. This is Eve. This is number one, the first one I ever built. And the attachment points are up on the top, so it kind of hangs like a Christmas tree ornament. Turned out to be not the best idea, but, you know, prototypes are like that. So this was my experiment. It's very simple inside compared to the other spheres. It's only nine feet in diameter because I didn't really know what I was going to do with it when I built it. Well, as soon as I hung it in the trees, well, I wanted to do something with it, so I rigged it out. You had a little kind of yachty-style camper interior. So my son and I lived in it when we first put it up in the trees. And for that summer, we built an addition on a house for a woman island, and we hung the sphere on her property while we did that. Everything just kind of hangs from the trees, like this stairway is all suspended. Nothing penetrates the trees anywhere. Where there's a bracket that goes around the trees, I block it out so that the, the tree won't grow over the bracket and it won't girdle the tree. Basically what the sticks do is they keep the, the clamp from digging into the tree. And then every year I'll take a come along and I'll take the tension off of the rope. And then it's like harness on a horse. You basically move all the blocks around and you just adjust it and let the horse get comfortable again and then put the tension back on and away you go. You're good for another year. So we can disappear out of here and everything vanishes without a trace. You'd never know we were even in the forest. And as it turns out, it's all biomimicry anyway, you know. You got this nature's packaging unit, the nutshell or the seed pod, and hanging off a spider's web or rope, you know. And of course, it functions really well in the forest. This one, to get the sphere in here, I had to actually swing it from tree to tree to tree. I've always been a tree climber and, and a tree house aficionado. This was the first big one I ever did. This was Rev 2. We knew Eve was too small, we need a bigger bed. Big storage lockers underneath, you know. We... And this is the first one I ever did the bronze hardware on. Custom cast bronze window hardware and the door hardware was different. And more windows, we wanted more windows. So this has got a skylight and a window in the door and a... And it's got a sink. It's just so people can make tea and coffee and brush their teeth. 
Yeah, the sink just basically drains to a gray water pit out in the forest, you know. I do have plumbing to eventually install a rainwater catchment system up in a tree, but I'm not going to do that here, so we're going to move first. The trees are really close on this one, you know, and it always depends on the type of forest you're in too. Like cedars, that's a cedar, the door tree, and this is a cedar over here. Cedars are great because the branches go right down to the ground, you know, so they're good screen trees. If you've got another sphere, you know, just 50 meters away and you've got a good couple of cedars in between, you won't see one from the other. Furs, like this is a fir, it's a different kettle of fish. A fir has a bare stem and then a great big live crown at the top. But it's a, not a good green tree because all the canopy's up top. You know, there's nothing down below. So when you're looking at a forest, you've got to kind of have a view to where multiple spheres are going to go. And where you can place screen trees in between so that you're not looking at each other's windows and everybody gets a feeling of being out in the forest all by themselves, you know. <laughs> this is Melody here. Melody is one of the bigger ten and a half foot spheres. Well, a sphere always hangs in a triangle of trees. It's a three-point suspension. Yeah, that was a tough tree to climb because there's no branches on it. I had to actually go up this one and then fire a line over that and get somebody to belay me because I don't climb with spurs. Every time you penetrate the bark of a tree, you introduce fungal spores inside and you start a decay cavity. So, so when you're using your trees for a foundation, you know, you've got to be respectful of that and treat them with care. You know, you want to keep them in good shape. Biomimicry is where you mimic a natural system and basically what happens here is nature's packaging unit has always been the seed pod or the nutshell, a hard shell case to protect the contents. It's moving. Yeah. I, mean, I was telling you before about the geometry of the grove, you know, yeah. like how the spacing of the trees makes a difference and how much the sphere moves. This one actually bounces a bit too oh, wow. because the tethers are long. And they're elastic. And then there's biomimicry. And there's a spider web idea. You know, like what we do is we hang the sphere from this web of rope. It's multiple lines to multiple trees so that like a spider, you've got many attachment points. And if one breaks, well, you've still got plenty of other ones holding it. And then we carry that spider web idea further out into the forest. We're taking these backstays and stabilizing the trees so that when the wind blows, nothing's gonna come down, you know. So this one has got a Murphy bed. You know, you've got a, a couple of tables, actually, in the daytime. There's two tables that actually come out of the bottom of the Murphy bed. So you can stay here and play a game of cards or have a bite to eat or what have you. And then at night, the tables go away. Okay, the tables go away, and then the Murphy bed comes out. So it's then great. it becomes bedroom by night, nice. kind of. It's a generous size. It's a double, yeah, yeah full-size double. And you built the Murphy bed? Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. hydraulics, or...? This has actually just got a couple of gas shocks, like you'd see in the back door of a hatchback or something yeah. like that, yeah. These are one kilonewton, it's about probably 150 foot-pounds force. Curtains for that night. Architecturally, the houses we live in are all boxes, and they're all about separation. Privacy. The walls are separate from each other, they're separate from the floor, they're separate from the ceiling. And we underline those separations with color and texture changes, like it's different material for the ceiling than it is for the wall, or different colors. In a sphere, there's only one wall. You know, it's a uniwall construction, you know. There's no separation between walls and floor and ceiling, it's all one. Ready for guests. Then this is just storage up here. 
No, it's a little storage locker. Well, I started thinking about spheres probably back in the 1970s when I saw Jacques Cousteau come out of the first bathosphere. And he said, my God, there's something about a sphere, you know, it's just amazing because the sound, the acoustic properties. Sure, he experienced that when he had his head in the middle and the sound bouncing back. And it never left me, you know. I always thought about, wow, there's got to be something to a sphere. And this is the shop where all the magic happens. Well, this one is just about finished. This is just getting upholstery now. In fact, I'm just making patterns to cut the foam pieces for the seating. This is the latest generation of sphere. The bed hides up against the ceiling. This is where I want to have a couple of brackets. There's going to be a track that goes in here and there'll be a car that anchors to the bracket. And that way the ladder can't get away from anybody. And it'll make it more stable when it's down on the ground too, because it'll be on a track. That way it can't pull away from the bed or move sideways. My bed. <laughs> and you're really in the dome now. Yeah, oh yeah. There's lots of room up here. I mean, there's plenty of room. You know, embodies that idea of oneness, of unity. You know, you do feel different when you're in a sphere. There's something about a sphere. You know? Everybody's coming up with new ideas how to utilize a tiny space a little more effectively. <laughs> By day, put the bed away, and you have your space back again. When you're dealing with such limited volume, you have to make it transformable in order to optimize. This bed takes up a lot of room. If the bed is down here where people can use it, there's not room for anything else, you know. So you, in the daytime, you got to get it out of the way so that you can have a couch. You know, and this could be a day bed. Somebody could lay down and have a nap here. When you come into an empty sphere, if you take your normal carpenter tools, like a square and a level, it's useless. You can't got anything you can put your level on, you know. So you've got to completely change from rectangular to polar coordinate system so that you can start working with a protractor and an azimuth and measuring radii and working with a compass and everything's different. Okay. And then there's a small sink in here. You always want to be able to wash your face and brush your teeth. You always come well, that's a chopping board, and it gives you more counter space. That's an idea from boats, mm -hmm. you know. So you have boat experience, or boat making experience, or just living? Both. I lived on a boat. I've sailed about 30,000 miles and, and built a couple of boats myself, too. So. How does that work? Well, oh, there's a couple of hydraulic cylinders in the corners here. I started out, I didn't use hydraulics. I, I used see. a screwdrive. And I had two motors driving two screw, and the motors didn't turn at exactly the same rate of speed. Oh. So if you made a hundred strokes of the bed up and down, after a hundred times, it was starting to twist up. This was a screwdriver. It was a motor driving a gearbox and an eight to one gear reduction. There was one in each tower and the two didn't turn at exactly the same speed. They were a little bit out of sync. So one turned a little faster. There's a shaft that comes through here mm -hmm. and there's a uh, rack and pinion. When this side goes up one tooth, that side also has to go a tooth because- Otherwise it doesn't work. Exactly. But you know, when you're doing something for the first time, it's an experiment. It's an experiment. And if it doesn't work, well, you tear it out and you do something else. This is actually a very high-tech little bobble. It's got more than just a hydraulic system. It's also got a heat recovery ventilator on this side. That's a, what the heat exchanger does is it constantly takes moisture-laden air from the tops of these two towers and sends it out. And the incoming air recovers the energy. So you're not throwing away heated air. That way I can catch all the moisture and get it out of the sphere so the walls don't sweat. And that way it preserves the sphere, you know. 
your spheres have a feeling that is very high tech, but then inside they feel cozy as well. Steampunk, they call it now. You know, <laughs> it's kind of uh, bronze and dark wood, and and the the window hinges here have all got runes, and that kind of ties it all together. You know, and makes it warm and you know, more jewels varnish. These are my patterns. So these are what you would use to make an impression in the sand. I learned to do this about 25 years ago. I built a foundry because the first time I built a great big sailboat, I was doing it up on a little village on the Alaska border called Stewart, BC, and there was no access to material or anything. So I had to make a lot of things myself. And one of the things I learned how to do was cast bronze. As far as materials for the structure, is there any advantage of using this material versus, let's say... Fiberglass is just an ease of construction thing, Nico. Like, to make a wooden shell, it's a man year's work. About 2,000 hours just to make a shell. And then another 4,000 hours to finish it inside. Ah. Whereas a fiberglass shell, three people can make it in a week. And it's just more durable, you know? Yes. Like, you take a fiberglass shell and you put good protective barrier like automotive paint or even gel coat on the outside that's going to last 40 or 50 years no problem so this is a composite it's got acrylic windows metal attachment point brackets a fiberglass shell you know how many points of attachment do you need normally for it's a three-point hang but i needed four attachment points because one of the attachments I want to line up on the center of the door. So the door faces one of the trees in the triangle. So you see these are angled. So I use an upside down Y. So there's two pieces of rope that come up and then they join in a common one. I use what they call a monkey plate. Well in, in sailboat terminology it's called a monkey plate. But what this does is it'll take those two ropes from each side of the door and then it combines into a single point that goes up to the top of the door tree. And that way the door is going to face one of my three trees. And that way I can do a stairway around the door and I can have a walkway that goes out. You up there, Anna? We're not confined to flat panels and square buildings anymore. Our construction techniques and material have evolved to the point where it's practical now. We're not stuck in that old square paradigm. So this one's actually got a finished door. Like everything else, it was an evolution, you know, like Eve, the first one, when you turn the handle, there's four pins that go out. This has got latches that actually, you know, pull back. So when you pull this door shut, it snaps shut, you know, and when you turn the handle, it opens. When you first open the door, there's these two springs here. What they do is they kick this side out so that it'll open. See, the first thing that happens is this side opens up because these springs pull. And then it gets out of the way so that it'll curve around. You can't have just a simple, you know, couple of hinges. And... So I have this hinge plane inside the closet there. And when the door opens, you can see how this hinge comes out of the compartment like that. And then it tucks away when you close the door. A conventional door, it's got flat on one side, and that's the hinge plane, right? Everything rotates along that one plane. On a sphere, you don't have a flat hinge plane, so I have to create one inside the sphere. And that's why these door hinges, they're actually like a big fish hook. Yeah, you just turn it. And this is what they call a bell crank, you know? When you turn it, it pulls. And you can see that when it pulls, the pins come back at the same time. You can tune the door, you know. You want all four latches to let go at the same time. And that works pretty slick. It's been really reliable. Like when you think of how many thousands of times that's been operated. I never have to do any work on these. So, so. was this inspired by submarines? No. <laughs> No, it was just physics and engineering, you know. And this is my window hardware. Again, the same thing, you know, like whenever you have a hinge plane, you've got to create a point where your rotation is going to be around. 
And then since the sphere and the hinge plane is on the inside, you have to have things double articulated so that it has to move on both ends. It's great, it really moves. <laughs> yeah, it really does. So this is fastened to wooden beams here, rather than the trees, so it is a lot yeah. more shaky. The other ones are a I lot see. smoother. This one is probably the most unstable feeling, but I kind of like it. So this one is hung not on trees? No, this is just a portable set of legs. It's like IKEA furniture. I can disconnect these wires and pull the pins out of there and it all comes apart and it fits onto a trailer. And so I can put the sphere on the back of my crane truck and the legs on a trailer and I've got a traveling sphere show, basically. I've always envisioned that if you walk up into the roof of a house and came out through a door in the attic and you could have a post coming off the top of the roof and you could have two other ropes up the trees on the back so that you could come out of an attic room and over a little suspension bridge into a sphere, you know, hanging from the trees. So that would be kind of a, a marriage of existing square box architecture and, you know, hanging sphere in the forest and the kind of a transition. I think even in somebody's like a spare room. And the mushrooms are uh, outhouses. They come with composting toilets. What happens is it's drum style and there's a big drum down there and this is a handle that'll actually rotate the drum so that you can mix. And there's a fan that constantly draws air through it so that there's never any smell. All the smell goes up the stack and, and it'll take the waste from two people continuously. As long as it's warm in the summer and the microbes are alive and and it just turns it into carbon dioxide, it never builds up. In the winter, when the microbes go dormant, then it's just a storage unit and it piles up for the whole winter. And then in spring, you gotta take some out and get it going again. So this is bathhouses. We rent this property, so there are a couple of trailers. The roof comes off, the deck comes off, its skirt comes off, and there's wheels underneath all that. But they're custom purpose built. This one has got two bathrooms and a little kitchen and a sauna. So they, this is where common space where guests hang out as well. They'll all be here barbecuing at night. And... Oh, Hannah's in the shower with her clothes on. So this is where guests come to use the bathroom anyway. Oh, I see. There you can see the names. That's yeah. Great. You're very light on the land then. I mean, you just yeah, move. And... Everything just kind of picks up and moves. You got a pump and haul septic system. Had a little pit in the ground that takes the septic and pumps it up to a couple of tanks. I always keep an empty shell out in the parking lot so people can climb in and play. When you climb in an empty shell and you stand in the middle and you say something, all the sound hits the walls and it comes straight back to you. Well, all the sound, like, I'm standing in the center, and you can't hear it, but it's really loud for me, because all of that sound is hitting the wall of the sphere, and it's bouncing straight back to me. So I get to hear me the way that you hear me. You know, I wish I was a better singer, because if I can hit the right note, it actually starts to resonate like a Tibetan bowl. I can't do it. you got to be real tight on the frequency, you know. It's different in the winter too. You know, once the deciduous trees lose the leaves, you know, it opens things up a lot. Yeah, even on a real stormy winter day, it's kind of a nice place to, to hang out because you're cozy and warm and dry and the sound of the rain on the roof, you know, it just drums me to sleep. God, I sleep like a baby out here. You know what we do is we get great guest comments. <laughs> Some of them are good too, yeah. My utopia is a network of spheres up in the trees, a kind of a canopy elevated boardwalk, village and then cob stuff down on the ground, cob or straw bale. You know, you need a few ground-based accommodations just because you can get a lot of square footage for a lot less 
money, you know, and a lot less embodied energy, if you will. People can go and climb up in their bedroom spheres and have their little hideaways, but, you know, there's always going to be room for a ground-based structure someplace. Dining area, meeting spaces, you know, extreme weather events, because it can get nasty, you know. We've seen... We've seen winds not far short of a hundred mile an hour, you know, and I That's... mean, it's tearing trees apart at that point. Treetops that weigh 500, 600 pounds are just sailing through the air, you know. Wow. Do you have to get out of these at that point? At 80 kilometers an hour, which is only probably about 50 miles an hour, mm -hmm. I come and tell people are welcome to a room in the house and encourage them to come in because things fall, you know. Just last winter, even in a snowstorm, there was a branch that hit this that probably fell from 50 feet up, and I bet it weighed 300 pounds. But I mean, the sphere, the biomimicry thing, because of the stretchiness of the suspension ropes, you know, you get a stress hill like that, because when it has the impact, the sphere moves and it absorbs that impact over a long period of time, so you get a stress hill you don't have. If it was rigid, you'd have a stress spike that looked like that, but since it's a stress hill, you know, the uh, sphere moves, the ropes stretch, it absorbs the impact so over not, a long time. It's, it's less just, likely to fracture. Yeah. Like, you know, those boards there, you can jump as hard as you like on those. You're not going to break them because they're suspended by rope and they're going to move and give. If that was between two rigid stones and it had yeah, no give, yeah. boom, it's going to break, you know. Yeah. So. And every one of them moves different. It depends on the geometry of the grove, kind of. Like Aaron, the tethers, the ropes that hold the sphere up, are almost straight up and down because the trees are really close to the sphere. But Melody, the tethers are a lot wider. And, you know, there's more of a shallow angle. And the trees aren't like grass. They get completely out of sync, you know, and they're going in different directions. And that yeah. gives it a little bit of up and down motion. The forest is such a healing place, and I think you're starting to learn that. In fact, I've read some really interesting articles about things like how healing it is in the forest, you know, reconnecting with nature and just letting go of your worries and your woes. And you know, I've read some really interesting things lately about, too, how trees talk to each other, how the root systems are all connected. And it's a biochemical thing, you know, they exchange sugars and organic compounds from the root system on one to the root system on another, and they'll warn each other that there's bugs or disease or, you know, hazards, and the trees start to harden for it. And, and it's just amazing, the connectedness, you know. A marriage of, you know, hanging sphere in the forest. Oh, the forest itself is just magic. It, it compounds the two, you know.